All right, let's go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Madhukar, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Single Store. And today I'm going to talk about something that uh, obviously no one has ever heard of, which is generative AI and LLMs. Well, this is one thing that happened, I guess, about six, seven, or maybe eight months ago, and now people cannot stop talking about it. But before I go down that path, I wanted to just paint a little bit of a picture over here on the importance of the why. Of course, Mark Andreessen, several years ago, he wrote famously in a paper that software is eating the world. And of course, since then, what we have seen is people have been talking about AI in different terms, in machine learning and other AI, but it hadn't really caught up till November of last year. And one thing I, I've been seeing personally, because I've been in the Valley, I, would start, I started my career as a developer, then I went into uh, product management, and now finally in product marketing and marketing. And one thing that you would notice that has happened in the last few years is that companies have not only started to use more software, but a lot of companies have become software. And if you think about it, just a few minutes ago, I took an Uber to come here. And Uber, sure, is a company, but it's also an app. And so is any other company that's out there today. They have not only started to use software or build software, but they've turned into software. And I feel this is where AI is headed towards, where companies, even if they have not started looking at AI, they are all going to be going in the similar direction, where at some point, everything that we interact with will either have a component of AI, or it would have turned into whatever we call as AI. And of course, the definition of AI keeps changing because sometimes we say, well, it's not creative enough, or it's, uh, sometimes we say it's not accurate enough, sometimes we say it's not faster than human, but with generative AI, we have seen all of that. It is creative, it generates stuff that doesn't exist before, which sometimes when we like it, we call it creativity, but when we don't, we call it hallucinations. So in my, you know, I've been talking to a lot of different companies and we have been working on a lot of different generative AI stuff as well. Today I'm going to show you how to build a generative AI based application end to end. And if you're interested in going into the details of how to build it, then come and also join us in San Francisco on October 17. That's when we are doing a full scale AI based developer conference. So when we talk to customers, and I'll tell you a little bit more about our, com our own company and what do we do, but when we talk to customers and the generative AI application that I see is being built, there are two main trends that we see. One is that most of the companies, when they are looking at LLMs or Gen AI apps, they want it to be specific to their data. And the reason for that is, whether it's OpenAI, whether it's Claude, whether it's Llama 2, all of these large language models have been trained on data set that's frozen in time. And at that time, it knew the weights and it knew the parameters and the biases, but it doesn't know about all the data that you have in your companies or in your enterprises that might be sitting inside of Mongo, inside of Snowflake, or it could be being generated in real time, like it could be a Kafka stream, or it could be some transaction that's being captured by MySQL. So when we look at uh, apps that companies are looking to build, first and foremost, they want to make it data aware to their data. And second, what we're seeing is now with baby AGI or even with auto GPT, people are not just building applications that talk to LLMs to get recommendations or translation or summarization and generation, they're also asking the LLMs to go do that action as well. So to give you a very simple example, I could say, go generate a blog article for me, and if I'm happy with the quality, then go publish it as well, and after you've published it, go to LinkedIn and post it and amplify it as well. So the steps that you do beyond generation is what is called agentic. And now there are libraries like Langchain or Llama Index that helps you do that as well. The third thing that's not on this slide is that we are seeing companies not just use one LLM, 
but they are seeing a use of number of different LLMs at the same time. So it's almost like an ensemble. You have something from uh, Hugging Face, but you might have something from Azure as well. And you're looking at the, you're evaluating those models to see which one's better for your data, and then eventually going to use that. So moving along, when you want to make something data aware, typically customers are saying, well, first of all, I want the LLM to know my custom data because my vocabulary might be different. If I take an example of single store, we have a project called Europa. Now if I take a context and tell an LLM to say what is Europa, it's going to come back and say, oh, it's a third moon of the Jupiter or something like that. Whereas in my case, when I say Europa, there's an entire corpus and a body of data specific to a project, specific to certain terms that the LLM doesn't know about. Second, I might be getting data that is instant, in the sense there might be a Slack channel where people are talking about an ongoing issue. And if there is a support chatbot which is answering or trying to help other customers and it doesn't know about all the new streams of data that's coming in, then it's not only inaccurate, it's incomplete and it's mostly a gimmick. So you also want it to be private and secure. For example, if I take all of my data related to M&A and put it in the same vector database and now somebody else is asking questions to that LLM directly, how do you know that the person who's getting that information back is entitled to that data or not? So there are a bunch of things to consider over there as well. So today, as of today, and I think this is going to be true for a very long time to come, LLMs, can be made aware of your data only in three different ways. You can either retrain your entire language model, and if you retrain your entire language model, it's basically you have to give it the data sets, that's your parameters, and then you have to train it, which is basically you figure out the weights between these parameters. And if you look at retraining, it's like wiping the memory of an entire LLM, and then trying to give it more information to learn something from new. So in effect, you're building another open AI kind of an LLM, which takes millions of dollars, several years, and a lots and lots of GPUs. The second thing that you can do is called fine tuning. And fine tuning is one of those things that open AI discovered between chat GPT 3.0 and 3.5, where they realized is that the large language models are very good in predicting the next word. But if you asked the question, it couldn't really answer it because it was still predicting the next word and the next word. So what they ended up doing was they created this data set which had queries and responses. And with the queries and responses, you feed it back to the LLM and then you use something called RLHF or real or reinforcement learning with human feedback. When the LLM answers that is correct, you get a good checkbox, and if you don't, you, you know, basically down it. So basically what you're doing in fine tuning is that. You keep your weights, you keep your parameters as is, but you're giving an additional set of data sets to make it behave in a different way. So you use fine tuning not to make your application have additional data, although you could do that, but that's an expensive way of doing it, or primarily to basically change the behavior. And the behavior could be, hey, when, whenever somebody asks a question, just answer in a sarcastic way, like a teenager, which is what my children do. Or just answer like a Shakespeare. So that's a behavior change, and you're not changing the entire data set. And the third one, interestingly, which has become extremely popular now, and that's where the database has come in, is called retrieval augmented generation. In another, in another word, it's also in-context learning or real-time learning. So what does it mean? What it basically means is, imagine there was this person who was super knowledgeable about all the internet data, but that person doesn't know whatever happened since September of 2021. It's kind of like the Avengers movie where somebody snapped a finger and your memory is wiped after that. Now when I'm talking to this person and say, tell me who won the gold medal for Olympics 2022, it's either going to make stuff up or it's going to come back and say, I don't know. So what you instead do is you go to your corpus of data, which in this case is Wikipedia, which has all the knowledge about the Olympics 22, and you do a search 
which is similar to the question I asked, then you take that curated data, hand it to the LLM in real time, and say, look, you're a really smart guy, now I'm giving you an open book, now answer this question. It's as simple as that. So with this, initially the LLMs, they couldn't take a lot of input, that's called the context. And initially it was roughly about, I think, 2,000. Eventually, uh, OpenAI now can support up to 32,000 characters. That's a pretty large book. And Claude, Anthropic's Claude, they came up with 100,000 tokens, which means you can literally give an entire thick book, four or five Bibles, in real time in order to get back the LLM to respond to it. So when you do RAG or RAG, it's basically this. You're sitting somewhere over here, your Gen AI application, and when somebody asks you something, the first thing that you do is you go back to your company data, and then you do something called a semantic search, and I'm going to talk a little bit more. Then you get that data, and you provide context to the LLM in real time, and you say, hey, here's all the data about Olympics 2022, here's the query, now go answer it. But when you do RAG, there are certain things that you have to consider when you're retrieving data. One, how do I retrieve the right context? Because my data could be either in PDFs or SQL, or it could be in JSON, or it could be in you know, binary format. It could be audio, it could be video, and so on. How do I deal with very long text? It could be GBs of data or terabytes of data. How do I deal with structured versus unstructured data? How do I deal with the freshness of data, which we just talked about? And finally, what about the performance and the cost to build vectors, which is next what I want to talk about. So a good way to describe how RAG works is with this thing called semantic search. Now we have all seen search, right? In search, what you typically do is you type out a word, and when you do a lexical search or a keyword match, your search algorithm is looking for those exact characters and exact word into your search. So in this sentence, which says Huskies are dogs from Alaska, if I asked, is there a dog in this sentence, because it can match the letters D-O-G, it will say yes. But if I ask this to say, hey, is there an animal in this sentence, then the keyword search doesn't know because it's an exact match. So there is this thing called semantic search or vector-based similarity search, which can actually do this pretty well. And in of October or November of 21, when OpenAI created the 3.5 GPT version, that's where they also came out with an embedding model, which got really good at figuring out which one, which words, and which sentences are closer to each other not at the point of retrieval, but at the point when you're converting it to a vector. So what is a vector? Semantic search has been around for a while, especially for images. Like if, you, if you're doing surveillance or surveillance, or if you're doing image matches or audio matches, basically it figures out that this piece of data is closer to this versus this, and it, it's pretty accurate. It's pretty good in coming back and saying, yes, even though this actress has two different hair color, it's the same person, because there's a lot of distance matching between the two. So how does this work? Semantic search works with something called vectors. So think of vectors, if you have ever done matrices in school, it's a bunch of numbers, numbers that are separated by commas. So it kind of looks something like that. But the way I like to describe it is, imagine we are in a three-dimensional space, and all the people are data. So if, I, if the people were words like a dog, or a boy, or a prince, or a king, then I know that a boy and a king is closer to each other because in this space they are closer to each other than a queen or a girl. So each person or each data point has a latitude or longitude number associated with it, which tells them here's my location of that object in this space. Now obviously latitude and longitude is only two dimensions. Imagine thousands of dimensions. So every object now has a number associated, which is the location of that object in that multi-dimensional space. Now when I search for it, so first of all, I create that vector, I store it in a vector database, 
and then finally I search it. When I search it, there are two algorithms that are very popular, have been famous for years and years. One is called cosine similarity, which is basically the angle between the two objects. The closer the angle, the closer the two words or two objects are. And the second one is called Euclidean distance, which is the actual distance between the two. So using these algorithms, you can figure out that this word is closer to this word, or this piece of image, or this object is closer to each other. Now when you feed that to LLM, the LLM has a much cleaner and accurate context for you. So there's, of course, a bunch of other things that you could do here as well. So typically what happens in an enterprise, of course, it's a very trivial uh, diagram of it, is you have a transactional database, you have an analytics database, you're doing ETL, and you have enterprise users, and you have all these other users using your application as well. Now, because of LLM application, you have a yet another kind of database that people have just started to build, and this could be something like Pinecone, or it could be something like Milvis, VV8, or there are even Python libraries that allow you to do it. But what's the problem with this picture? The problem is you have now added yet another technology, yet another database, where you have to move the data around, which is far more expensive. That data still doesn't have all the other data that you currently have, and it doesn't have the context of what is fresh and what is not, so you end up doing a lot of these other gymnastics. My take on this is vectors is not the same as context. Vectors is only a part of context, so what is context? Context is all data relevant to your company. It's data that you can join between vectors and transactional. It is data that you can quickly prototype and deploy using something like Python. And you should be able to run this as an enterprise database. And so this is where, this is a little bit of a pitch for single store, which is where I work. At single store, single store is a database that can do both row-based data as well as columnar-based data. So imagine if Snowflake and MySQL had a baby, but it was much faster and much more prettier. That is single store. It used to be called MemSQL, but over a period of time, we developed a patented technology that can store data both for transaction as well as analytics. And in 2017, when Google wrote the first paper on transformers, we introduced something called vectors. And vectors have been around in single store for seven, eight years, and we have customers who have been using it in production for that many years as well. So at a very high level, like I said, we have row-based, we have columnar-based, we have support for SQL, we have support for Mongo APIs, we are adding support for Apache, uh, Iceberg, we have support for JSON, time series, you name it, and we can run you can run single store just like a MySQL, either locally as a Docker container, or you can run it in the cloud and you can choose wherever you want to run. And the secret sauce, I was just talking to one of my colleagues, is what we call as a three-tier storage, where when your data comes in, it goes straight into the memory. And that's why we were known as MemSQL. There were only three in-memory databases 10 years ago, Redis, Memcached, and MemSQL and MemSQL then turned into a columnar over a period of time, and you can move data into objects as well as into SSDs and NVMEs. So this is kind of the structure of why single store works really well with real-time data, both for transaction as well as aggregate functions. We have customers that have been using us in real time for running their business, companies like Comcast, companies like Akamai, Palo Alto Networks, and if you go to our website, you'll be able to see all the, all the different case studies that we have there. But moving along, these are the customers that have been using vectors for the last six or seven years, also for fraud detection, fraud prevention, surveillance, as well as uh, you know for Thorn, it's protecting children by looking at a lot of videos that could be harmful, and then in real time, matching it and then applying logic on top of it to prevent it. I won't get into too much of details here because I do believe uh, I'll be running out of time very soon and I do want to have an open discourse here so we'll leave some time for questions so you can 
ask whatever is on your mind. But one thing I do want to add is that very recently, we added this notion called notebooks. If you're familiar with Python notebooks or Jupyter notebooks, we have something called, of course, single store notebooks. And what it allows you to do, as you can see on the left-hand side, is you have your compute and your database separated, so you can scale horizontally, infinitely if you wanted to. And now you can run Python code on top of your data. So what this is showing is that literally in this Python notebook, you have an end-to-end -end LLM-based application that I just described, where you take a PDF, you upload it, it gets converted into vectors, and now you just run your Python code over here to then go and run against it and do you know, LLM-based queries. So if you are interested in this, I would say go to singlestore.com, sign up for free, and when you create a new notebook, it'll give you five or seven different options of choosing. You can choose an LLM-based, Langchain-based application, and then you can go from there. And the reason why we got into this was because back in Jan, Feb of this year, we started to think about, hey, how do we make our own technology and our own database that uh, can understand in pure English and then convert that into SQL for data science users? So what we did was we created this thing called SquirrelBot, which uses RAG, but it only answers questions related to single store. So it's a custom bot that we created. It uses OpenAI in the background. And what you can do with it is if you go to the website and also in the notebook, it will generate the single store SQL for you. It can optimize your SQL for you. It answers questions related to the product. And it can also generate code that you can add to your notebooks. So one of the things that we recently did, and I'm happy to show this as a demo later on as well if you reach out to me, but if you go to chat GPT, there is now a plugin for single store. You can literally connect your database to it and ask questions in plain English. You could say, hey, in my database, tell me what is the shape of my database. Tell me what insights do you see. Now go create a line graph for it. Now, of course, if I'm a data scientist, I can go further and say, okay, between these different features, I want to go do a regression. It generates the code and if you want it to be executed, then you just say yes, go add it to my notebook, and it gets executed as well. Before I go, this is the architecture st stack that we see being evolving in enterprises, where you have the data layer. The data layer consists of both SQL, data lake, JSON, Slack, unstructured data. Then there's the decision layer, which is very similar to the humans prefrontal cortex, and then of course there's the UI layer. And if you look at this layer, this is where the contextual database come in. So it's not just vectors, it's a combination of vectors with all the other things that we talked about. Now if I just took this and double clicked into that, then what you see is an architecture like this. And this kind of describes what single store can do today, but if you so choose to not use single store, and go build your own, then these are the pieces that you would need to build. You would have to have ETL as well as pipelines from all of these formats at the bottom. You would have a thin layer of vectors, but you need to figure out which vectors gets updated when, and how do you optimize the cost, generation, storage, and so on. And then you have a semantic layer with a disaggregated compute on top, which for us is notebooks, which is running on, is running on basically GPUs and CPUs if you choose to. So if I were to build this app, I would choose an LLM, I'll choose a vector strategy, and I'll use a retrieval augmented generation. That's what we did. So in this case, the overall architecture would look something like this. I might have one LLM from Hugging Face, I might have one from Anthropic or OpenAI, <laughs> excuse me. And then I would have single store with pipelines coming from different places, where that becomes your layer to talk to your LLM. Next, I would use uh, vectors within single store. In single store right now, you can store it as a binary, so it's highly efficient. And then we do an exact neighbor search, which is highly accurate. And then we are working on a few announcements that should come out in October. And then finally, you run a dot product, 
which is a vector function within your SQL to grab the similarity search. Here's a very quick example of what happens if you're interested in code. I'm happy to share that after this as well. Uh, this is when you retrieve the vectors and the real, I would say, magic here is that you're combining both lexical and semantic in milliseconds versus doing ETL, doing 20 other different joins and then coming back and responding to the LLM in a few seconds. So if you were to pay attention to this one over here, um, as you can see, we are doing a select from different tables, and then finally what we are doing is, we are also doing a dot product over there. So you're doing a vector search and joins, and you're re-ranking it based on that query and getting the result back in milliseconds so that you can then give it back to the LLM. In the end, this is the overall architecture where you would take a PDF, you chunk it, you use some sort of an API to create the embeddings or vectors, then you push it inside a single store, and then the rest of the rag is exactly the way we saw. And that's pretty much it. So if you're interested in this, like I said, you can go to our YouTube channel as well or just scan this you'll be able to go and create your own database and when you choose a new notebook, you can choose an LLM based notebook which uses Langchain and then basically you'll be able to just create an entire thing in a few minutes in exactly the same way that I just showed. We also do weekly webinars around LLMs and AI and how to build applications. So if you're interested, go to our website and sign up for one of these that comes up. Uh, let me see if we have some time for questions. Two minutes. Maybe one question. Are there any questions? All right, so if there are no questions, then thank you very much.